This is Rob from the Jewish Funders Network in New York. We have an incredible, incredible group today. Um, they're listed on the slide you can see before you in order of appearance um, to talk about the Syrian refugee crisis. Um, we had had this scheduled for many weeks already, but um, in the light of last weekend, we've got uh, two incredible speakers. We have Rabbi Jenny Rosen and Mark Hetfield joining us from Hyas, in addition to um, Sana Stassel from the Multifaith Alliance, Shadi Martini, and of course, um, Dr. Georgia Bennett and Charlene Seidel. Um, thank you all for being here. Just a quick uh, moment on JFN and what we do. Um, we're a network of Jewish funders who are interested in creating change through networks. We create programming that is based in our JFN values, um, and the value that I think is most personified in this program is, of course, Tikkun Olam, repairing the world, um, finding a way to live together. Um, the funders and individuals that are on this call are committed to that work, um, and we're really looking forward to hearing from all of you. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand this off to Mark Hetfield from HIAS. Hi, and thanks for inviting me to speak on this call. I literally just left a call with the State Department, um, which was the first call, that first formal call that we've had with them since the executive order was released on Friday night. So I have some pretty, uh, pretty late-breaking information. Um, just quickly, in terms of the background of, of HIAS on this issue, so HIAS, as I think all of you know, is the uh, global Jewish organization that protects refugees, and we've been doing that since 1881. We already had to undergo one transformation in our history. Uh, we were an organization that helped refugees because they were Jewish. Today we help refugees because we are Jewish. But we underwent a second transformation just over this past weekend. And that is, for the last 37 years since the passage of the Refugee Act of 1980, HIAS has been a partner, a formal partner, uh, of which gets being and also collaborates very closely with the United States government in the areas of refugee protection and resettlement. Um, we have done that through both, both overseas, where in Latin America, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe, we actually identify and refer refugees for resettlement to the United States and elsewhere, but primarily to the United States. And in the United States, um, we work in cooperation primarily with Jewish family service agencies, but also with other independent community-based organizations around the country to welcome and resettle refugees in, and again, a private-public partnership with the United States Department of State. And that consists of picking the refugees up at the airport, getting them uh, apartments, getting them settled into their, into their apartments, into their new life, getting them uh, jobs, getting, the, getting their kids in school, teaching them English, just making sure that they are self-sufficient, and then ultimately getting them on a path to American citizenship, which they, uh, which they are eligible for after five years. Uh, in, in short, we, make ref we try to make refugees feel welcome to the United States, and we do this in close cooperation with uh, Jewish communal agencies. But well, that's what changed on Friday night, is while we have been a partner with the United States for the last 37 years, and our, everything about our organization reflects that, uh, on Friday night, we, that partnership was more or less broken. We are now on, the, the United States government is now frankly seen not as a partner, but as an adversary. We have become a bit of an insurgent agency uh, because we are fighting this vile executive order with absolutely everything we have. Uh, and and we, we frankly are, are jeopardizing that partnership by doing so, what's left of it, but we are disregarding that. What's first in our mind are the refugees and making sure we do right by the refugees because that's why HIAS was created and that's what our, our mission is all about. Um, so what, we are, what, what did the executive order do? A lot of you probably know this, but what it did is it, it uh, destroyed the refugee program in many ways, not just in one. Um, and, and that's what really needs to be emphasized. One, it created a total suspension of the refugee program for 120 days for all refugees, regardless of religion, regardless of nationality. Um, there are some exceptions which it allows, but we have to emphasize those, there are no automatic exceptions. Every exception needs to be signed off on by the Secretary of State or the Acting Secretary of State and the Secretary of Homeland Security. 
Um, there was just a number of exemptions made uh, just over the last day for refugees who are in transit, um, and, and that allow, that's allowing about 877, 880 refugees to enter uh, this week. But I have to emphasize those refugees are not from Syria, Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, or Yemen. If you are on that list of countries, you are not coming in even if you were en route to the United States when the border was issued. Um, so they are making an exemption, but only for refugees who are not among those seven nationalities. So in addition to suspending the program for 120 days, they instituted a 90-day ban on, on refugees of those nationalities and also of all immigrants and, and visitors of those nationalities. Um, even people who had a multiple entry visa could not re-enter the United States. Initially, even people with a green card could not re-enter, but they undid that. Um, initially, even special immigrant visa holders, which is people who fought alongside the United States during the Iraqi conflict, were not allowed uh, to enter. That has been reversed. But only the entry ban for lawful permanent residents and special immigrant visa holders from Iraq has been reversed. It remains in effect for everybody else of those seven nationalities, refugees, uh, tourists, students, uh, uh, immigrants, everybody. Third way um, they killed the refugee program is through a suspension of Syrian refugees indefinitely and pres until President Trump decides himself to reverse that. And, and Syrian refugees had recently become the largest refugee group in our program. They are certainly the largest refugee group in the world right now in the greatest need of resettlement. One in every five refugees in the world is Syrian. Um, so that has been stopped indefinitely. Um, Another way he killed the refugee program was by lowering the admission ceiling from 110,000, which was set by President Obama, to 50,000. And then finally, he killed the refugee program, as if it wasn't dead enough already, um, by granting governors the authority to have some kind of say-so over accepting refugees in their states. Uh, they were careful the way they worded this because they didn't want to totally delegate federal authority to the governors, but basically uh, they have done that to the extent that they can. So governors will now have a much more active role in deciding if they can shut their doors uh, to refugees. So this is a deadly, deadly provision um, with, which will have deadly results. It will, it will be harmful in multiple ways. It will not only harm those who are bound for the United States or who would have bound for the United States. But whether, whether Donald Trump likes it or not, the United States has always been a leader in refugee protection. And it can, we are both a leader, we could be a leader to the top or a leader to the bottom. Obama was finally, after seven years of ignoring the refugee program, leading us to the top in his last year in office by doing a number of things to enhance refugee protection, such as convening the first refugee summit ever of world leaders to focus on the refugee crisis, increasing our refugee admissions from 85,000 to 110,000 over a relatively short period of time. It was finally getting his attention, but that has been um, uh, aggressively reversed um, by this administration with a stroke of a pen on uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Day and on after the lighting of the Shabbat candles. Um, so that is particularly offensive to us as Jews because the entire refugee protection regime came out of the ashes of the Holocaust to make sure that never again do we turn refugees over to their persecutors. But once again, we're in that situation because by the United States behaving this way, it's very similar to what we did in 1921 when the United States slammed its doors to refugees and that shortly thereafter was followed by Canada, South Africa, Australia, other traditional countries of immigration doing the exact same thing. And that's the, the trend that we're afraid that we're going to start seeing. This is a very, very dark time for refugee protection. What can we do? What are we doing at HIAS? Um, we, with the State Department just tried to soothe us by telling us that this is a temporary ban, although it does look like it's much more severe, and it is much more severe for Muslims um, than for everybody else. Uh, there is an exemption for religious minorities in this ban, but again, that is not an exemption that's easy to get. It still requires sign-off by cabinet-level officials for two different cabinet departments. Um, it, what, what really, another offensive thing about this ban is that 
Uh, they keep saying that, well, Obama discriminated against Christian refugees and religious minorities, and we're not going to do that. We're going to make it easier for them. It's harder, much harder now for religious minorities than it was last Thursday to get into the refugee program, and it will remain much harder for religious minorities than it was last Thursday to get into the refugee program. Um, it's just going to be less impossible for them than it is for Muslims, uh, particularly Muslims from, from those countries. Um, so what are we doing? We are doing everything we can as, as advocates, um, but we have to advocate from the outside. We do not have the connections to the White House that we had before. I did manage to use one connection that I had to get a Syrian family reunited, um, a, a, a man who had gotten asylum in Connecticut, a uh, Syrian man three years ago. His, his, um, his uh, wife and his two young daughters, ages five and eight, had gotten permission, authorization, security clearances, and everything after living for three years as refugees in Jordan, after two years of separation from uh, the father and, and husband in Connecticut. They'd finally gotten authorization to travel to the United States. Uh, they were turned around on their connecting flight in Kiev on their way because when they departed Jordan, it was before the executive order had been issued. And by the time they got to Kiev, the executive order had been signed, so they were not allowed on the plane. Uh, they were sent back to Amman with no place to go. Uh, we had to use our connections, our only connection, and it's a rather tenuous one, to the White House and got that reversed. But that is the only, um, those are the only Syrian cases, to my knowledge, that are coming into this country at all uh, right now. So we are, um, we, the United States is planning litigation. I mean, the highest is planning litigation against uh, Donald Trump, the United States government, for this heinous order. And Jenny will talk about what we're doing to, to get the Jewish community to speak out on it as well, because we need to speak out with a loud voice, um, because we do not have the government on our side right now. We do have, I will say, we do have a lot of good civil servants on our side who are going to do everything they can to execute this executive order as humanely as possible. These are people within the State Department and within U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. But we have countervailing forces in other parts of Homeland Security, which we are going to have to fight, and we're going to have to fight the White House and Steve Bannon um, and the National Security Council on this. So we, the, the deck is stacked against us, but um, I have to say that we are very pleased with the amount of community support we're getting, um, with the amount of public interest in this. That's the one good thing that has come out of this crisis. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, now we're going to hear from Sana uh, from the Multi-Faith Alliance. Uh, thank you, um, Marav, and, and, and Mark, thank you so much for that fabulous, um, if, if highly disturbing, intro um, to, to what's changed in America in really just a few weeks. Um, I'm going to uh, defer discussion of, of, of the Multi-Faith Alliance um, proper to Georgette and Shadi in the interest of, 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 of time, but want to thank Hyas for being one of our wonderful participating organizations. Um, and I'm also going to take a step back really quickly to, to kind of set the stage for where we stand right now, not, not limited, although that really does seem to be what's, what, what's highly pressing, and I, I underscore every adjective Mark to use of heinous, vile, terrible, and, and really potentially catastrophic for, 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 for so many families globally. Um, we have a new president, and the ramifications are very broad. Um, they, this, the, the new administration will have 4,000 appointees throughout the executive branch, and it's, it's important to note that in the cabinet departments that have the most jurisdiction over, over refugee issues, state, justice, health and human services, and homeland security, and defense is going to get involved too, it, it appears, there, they are, there are the most um, of the presidential appointees throughout the, the, the administration. And uh, so far, um, uh, only two of the cabinet secretaries have been confirmed. Uh, there was a highly rancorous um, uh, committee uh, session and vote to send prospective attorney general sessions to the floor this morning. There's tremendous polarization, um, but we ought to pay close attention 
to some of the undersecretary appointments that will be coming very soon, um, including and 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 most particularly um, the United States Citizen and Immigration Service, where some very 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 uh, potentially um, difficult uh, uh, names are floating. Um, Marav, could I have the next slide, um, please? Um, this is a very very basic overview, but I I, I want you to uh, be aware of what the configuration is in the legislature in the Congress right now. Um, as a result of, of the last election, there are in the Senate 52 Republicans and 46 Democrats, two independents who caucus with the Democrats, which gives us a 52-48 split. There was something of a Democratic pickup, two seats over the last Congress, but um, uh, I, although uh, 52 and with the vice president um, as tiebreaker, Republicans is not an overwhelming majority. Um, the fact is that um, for most things, um, a, a majority vote will be all that's necessary, and a party line vote will indeed um, lead to uh, 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 results that may well support the administration. In the House, 240 Republicans, 193 Democrats currently, a, Democrat, a small Democratic pickup, but there's only 218 votes needed for a majority, and there's a comfortable 22-seat um, Republican um, lead on that score. Um, I want to move to the next slide, which is, 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 is where the real action is right now, um, which is that the legislative response to um, the executive order has been um, uh, swift, um, and there are currently much more than two, but there were two kind of flagship bills introduced almost immediately. Um, uh, uh, Representative Lofgren, um, I know we have Californians on the line, she's been a tremendous leader on immigration issues, introduced the Statute of Liberties Values Act, uh, called SALS, uh, acronym, um, with 185 co-sponsors as of this morning. Um, they are all Democrat, and that is 185 of 193. We just looked at Democrats. Um, the bill, these are very simple bills. This one has only two provisions. It would declare the executive order null and void, and it would also um, ensure that no funds, even those already appropriated that are um, uh, to DHS, uh, that's Homeland Security, or any other federal agency, uh, be used to implement any of the executive order policy changes, including the um, promulgation of regulations. Uh, in the Senate, a sort of companion bill was introduced by Senator Feinstein, also of California. It currently has 35 co-sponsors, um, and it's even simpler. It simply rescinds the executive order and would nullify any uh, potential legal effects. Uh, both of these bills, um, there was effort to, to get sort of irregular, meaning in immediate floor action. Um, in, the, in the House, uh, there was a strategy uh, mostly in, in employed yesterday to use floor time for other matters to seek um, unanimous consent to bring this, this bill to a, a floor vote immediately. That was um, defeated. So the bill has now been referred um, to uh, four relevant House committees. Um, on the Senate side, Senator Schumer uh, tried very hard to bring the bill up for floor action, and that too did not succeed because it required unanimous consent and there was objection. So um, it, it now too has been referred uh, on the Senate side to the Judiciary Committee. These are just the beginning. There are already um, other bills um, in, uh, you know, being, being, being uh, discussed, vetted, introduced, and there will be many more. We already know of, of, of more bills from Senator Feinstein. I know Senator Leahy is, is trying very, very hard to um, put together a um, bill that would indeed have some Republican co-sponsorship. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg, but I do have to revert to the, the previous slide and point out that there are um, Republican uh, majorities in both houses of Congress 
which is going to make it extremely difficult for these these kinds of bills to um, to succeed. But they are notwithstanding cr critically important um, as, a, as, as, as as public markers and public statements. And and if there and it may be that as we progress. If things become difficult enough and public pressure is, 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 is applied continuously and sufficiently enough, that there will be a few Republicans that can be um, brought to the table, and that will make uh, an extraordinary difference. Um, Marab, next two slides, we, we just showing you that I just wanted to, I don't know, some of these slides are being kind of cut off, but um, this, this first slide shows that at introduction, um, the and these were all done in such a hurry, but the Senate bill had, um, I think it's 27, um, endorsing organizations. Um, proud that the Multi-Faith Alliance was one. Um, proud that HIAS was one. And actually, there are a number of um, wonderful entities um, that are both participating organizations of um, the Multi-Faith Alliance and others on this list. Um, the next slide actually, I believe, shows you the same the same information for the um, for the Lofgren um, measure. Um, again, I, and I, I want to emphasize, I'm not I can't make a hundred percent commitment that these are um, up to date lists because it's everybody, as Mark pointed out, is flying. So some of this data is uh, still in formation. But at introduction, I think there were 24 endorsing organizations, not identical, um, but the Multi-Faith Alliance and, and HIAS are, um, and others um, that we uh, work with are on that list. Moving along, um, next slide, please. Um, I was asked to try to uh, speak just for a minute um, about what we can anticipate. It, it, right now, the executive order is consuming every amount of, 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 of kind of available space. And um, although the president has shown his, himself to be a master at changing the conversation, and he did rather masterfully, um, I must admit, with the announcement of the Supreme Court nominee last night. Um, notwithstanding, um, I think and hope that the pressure around the executive order is, is, is not going to go away. Um, but just to kind of, you know, uh, uh, put in some context what else we can um, be thinking about and collectively work against or for, what we might have expected in this 115th con Congress is, first, ne legislation that could negatively affect refugees. Um, we saw the advent of such legislation, or efforts to pass such legislation, in the last Congress, starting with um, the Security Against Foreign Enemies um, bill, known as SAFE, which kind of popped up after the Paris attacks and was kind of the um, opening salvo, I would say, in the anti-refugee legislative battle, um, it would have added burdensome requirements to the already comprehensive screening and vetting process we have for uh, refugees and, and, and frankly, um, make it, it, it quite uh, impossible for Syrians to resettle here. It, did uh, move through the House, it did not move through the Senate, and there would have been um, a presidential veto, um, which is, uh, is not um, a strategy uh, we uh, can count on any anymore. Um, but subsequent to the SAFE bill, there were a number of, of, of different um, kind of um, uh, takes on it introduced throughout the last Congress. All those bills are null and void at the end of the Congress, but we could if, depending on what happens with the executive order, if it doesn't do all, this, you know, wipe out all these issues because it takes care of them already, um, we could see these kind, of, this kind of negative legislation come up again, and uh, with much greater likelihood of success. And all of them, them go to questions or, or accusations like our current vetting is insufficient, even though there's a great deal of mythology that we have to uh, to uh, dispel around that that too much money is expended on um, the refugee program and that we are not adequately monitoring um, those admittees to the, to the United States and, and variations on that theme that are all highly detrimental. Um, additionally, Sana, I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time. We've got to move on to Shadi or we won't get to everyone. Okay. Well, then let me just wrap up and say that, 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 that 
we obviously have a very activist president that's not afraid to use his authority to uh, or push push it to the limits, and that um, I think that a lot of these matters will end in the federal courts. We are, there are already um, uh, multiple lawsuits filed around the country, um, and state attorneys general who plan to join in. So we all have a very, 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 very uh, uh, clear road to hoe in the next in the next months and years. Thank, Thank you. I'm sorry to overrun. No worries. Thank you so much, Sana. That was full of very important information for all of us as we enter this uh, new presidency. And now we are going to hear from Shadi Martini, who um, can update us more about Syrians on the ground. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll give a brief uh, about my uh, story. Uh, I was uh, a general manager of a hospital in Aleppo, Syria. I witnessed what was going on in Syria since March uh, 2011. As a manager of a hospital, we, I went with colleagues of mine to try to help demonstrations who were being shot at that time to get the medical aid that they were deprived on. Later on, there was a lot of areas in Syria that was under siege, so we provided the medical aid and medical equipment and uh, to them that uh, put me in harm's danger. As my colleagues, I was forced to leave uh, Syria in uh, 2012, and since then I was work I'm working uh, to provide aid uh, to s inside Syria and to help uh, refugees and, uh, and also internally displaced people around the region. I joined the Multi-Faith Alliance in 2013, uh, and that was because of my work for, uh, with the uh, different uh, religious and regional uh, uh, groups and to try to advance this cooperation between them and to try to help uh, the Syrian uh, war victims. I will try to give you a recap of uh, what's happening on the ground now. Uh, Syria at the moment, uh, we now since uh, more than a year now, we have a Russian intervention inside Syria. And since like a month now, we have a, a so-called ceasefire that was brokered between Russia and Turkey. There is a lot of fighting, but there is still a lot of fighting going on. Not a lot of coverage going uh, going going on explaining what's what's happening but still the situation is very dangerous and still a lot of people are being driven from their homes and um, uh, and, tr and trying to make it to other country unfortunately uh, most of the countries have sealed off their borders so this is a reason if you notice that we have for a year now a number is hovering about four million eight hundred to four million nine hundred uh, thousand uh, registered refugees. The reason it's not that there is not, uh, ref, uh, you know, people trying to go, but they are just being prevented. Uh, so uh, Turkey has sealed its border, Jordan has sealed its border, and Lebanon also. Almost, uh, it's very hard to get into. Uh, that's that's increasing the number of internally displaced people. So we were seeing more and more. Uh, refugees uh, along the northern border. You will go and see uh, cities of tents. The same thing is the, uh, happening in Jordan. And of course, another reason is a lot of countries have stopped registration of refugees. So for instance, Lebanon for more than a year now have ordered the UNHCR not to register refugees and it's happening in Turkey. So there's a lot of reason why we're not seeing this number increasing, but it's not that there's a lack of people forced to leave uh, forced to leave their home of course a lot of people tried especially in the last fiscal year to make it into europe and there is a notion that most of them is syrians yes the biggest number is syrians but for instance for the last fiscal year in europe from one million three hundred and seventy seven thousand uh, asylum seekers uh, there was only four hundred and twenty five uh, thousand syrians uh, but and actually, in the last uh, you know year, there was a decrease of 38 percent of Syrian refugees. At the same time, we see increases in other refugee uh, populations. For instance, from Afghanistan, they constituted two, uh, 226,000, and of course, a big increase also from 
Iran in percentage wise 141 percent but in number wise only 47 47,000 um, uh, happening of course the reactions to what uh, and the response to what's happening in Syria is that a lot of a lot of organizations are trying to uh, bring aid into Syria and to surrounding countries now that most of the borders are sealed off and Syrians can not go anywhere Greece was the last to uh, close it in uh, in March of last year that made about 70,000 to 80,000 people stuck inside Greece there was an agreement inside the European Union to this, to relocate them to other countries but this is moving very very slow so most probably 90 percent of their Syrian refugees are stuck in three countries mainly Turkey having the biggest number of about 2 million 800 then Lebanon then Jordan and of course there are about 26,000 to 30,000 in North Africa but the biggest number in this uh, three countries uh, neighboring Syria the response that we are uh, was happening a lot of organization it is for, of course going through um, Turkey trying to uh, bring in aid inside Syria uh, from the northern border and of course there is Jordan and the third option that has been developed uh, uh, recently is uh, uh, through uh, Israel but that's to another webinar that we that's going to happen soon and it's going to explain what's going on but it was it was a major uh, breakthrough at that now we have this uh, corridor also open uh, so, in, gen in general, this is the situation in Syria, and I'm trying to be very brief to give opportunities to uh, everyone else to give you additional information. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shadi. Um, we're moving along to hear from Charlene Seidel from the Leishtag Foundation, a funder case study in this work. Thanks, Mayrav. It's, it's a pleasure to be on the call with everybody um, talking about this really, really important issue. I decided to spare you a lot of dense slides. So um, uh, just to talk a little bit about why the Leash Tag beca Foundation became involved in this issue, um, something that Mark from Haya said really resonated around that um, in that when he said that Hayes used to help refugees because they were Jewish and now because we do it because we are Jewish. That very much inspired us. We um, were founded by Lee and Tony Leestag. Lee was the son of um, Hungarian uh, refugees. Tony was also an immigrant. And um, that, that um, history that so many of our foundations, I think, have in the Jewish community and families, as well as the Jewish values around welcoming the stranger and um, that being the most um, repeated uh, precept and, and, and value in our tradition really catalyzed our involvement. I would say also um, the inspiration of Dr. Georgette Bennett, who you'll be hearing from later in the, in the webinar, the founder of the Multi-Faith Alliance, also really catalyzed our involvement. We, we first made our grant in this area back in 2013 when Georgette and I, over actually a lunch at a JFN board retreat in Israel, um, we're talking about um, the situation in Jordan in the refugee camps, how precarious it was. What a this was before a lot of this was really on prime time news, but how 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 unstable the region was becoming, and what a great humanitarian disaster this was. So we made a grant at that time, an emergency grant that supported um, the Jewish Coalition for D Disaster Relief and Hyas um, through well, before even the MFA, I think, was established to deploy some highest case managers on the ground um, in the refugee camps in Jordan. We then um, announced in September, or on Rosh Hashanah of 2015, that we were going to become, um, we were going to launch a Syrian refugee initiative um, and said, and not as a separate strategic area, but really feeling like it advanced all of our strategic areas, which is promoting Jewish life, advancing self-sufficiency, um, the relationship with Israel, all were reflected in this great humanitarian disaster. Um, 
at that time, we weren't really sure what was gonna what was gonna happen in terms of refugees coming into this country, and also coming into our home community of San Diego. We know that we knew that San Diego had been a resettlement site or a large resettlement site over time, but but weren't really sure what was gonna happen. So we have a two we had a two pronged approach. One was around advocacy and streamlining the system, um, uh, not compromising on security, but real and, and vetting, but really. Um, uh, working on a national level around advocacy issues, and then we um, made a commitment to Jewish Family Service locally, um, working closely with HIAS around preparing for an influx of Syrian refugees to really make San Diego, we hope, the most welcoming city for Syrian refugees should they come. About nine months passed after that with, without um, much in terms of an influx, um, and actually with the Paris attacks, we wondered would we even use this, these funds we had set aside. But indeed, starting in about in the early summer of 2016, San Diego became the number one resettlement site in the country for Syrian refugees with about 1,000 resettled here. Um, so uh, that was a real opportunity for us. Um, we had also reached out to Hyas because the foundation owns an agricultural property, knowing that there were um, there was agricultural talent coming in to this community to see if we could deploy that talent here. Um, but kind of building on that, really understanding deeply that diversity is an economic driver, it's a social driver, it can do so much to, to, to strengthen a community. Um, just three more quick uh, notes about our case study. We, we formed a very interesting relationship with the local Syrian community that had, Syrian American community that had been here for a couple decades and were actually quite affluent, had a lot of resources. They approached us and they, they knowing that we had declared that we would want to be involved in this issue, and they said, look, we have the resources um, and we can raise money, but we want to learn from you how the Jewish community has organized in order to welcome in refugees um, of your own people because we want to be able to do the same. And so that was on September 1st, exactly four months ago. And in the meantime, we provided a number of, a, a bunch of capacity and resources, and they've developed the local Syrian community network to be an incredible um, um, organization that is really welcoming in the refugees, running an adoptive family program, helping with all kinds of basic needs. It's really been an interesting inspiration in how the Jewish community can provide so much more than just dollars, but a, an abundance of other resources um, based on our experience as Jews. Two more quick things. We also, um, during the terrible times of the siege on Aleppo, we um, made some emergency grants. Um, at that time, which we announced on social media, not knowing really what the response would be, and the response was phenomenal. We heard from a number of other foundations that asked for our due diligence because they also wanted to recommend um, uh, similar grants to their board. We asked, uh, we asked our community, um, or we heard from our community who were in general very supportive of our work, and I think, you know, that taught us something. We had, of course, heard from a few loud voices at, when we announced this Syrian um, refugee initiative about their concern, their fear that this wasn't something that Jews should be doing. We were told, why would you be welcoming terrorists into, your, into our community? But actually, the majority, the silent majority, um, who became um, uh, inspired, I think, by that announcement around Aleppo, was actually felt the opposite. They, they, they felt very strongly and, su and supportive that the Jewish community should be at the forefront of these issues. So on that note, um, we, are, we just have been planning in the last few days, along with the Anti-Defamation League, Jewish Family Service locally, and our federation, and a number of synagogues, um, a, com a Jewish community teach-in for tomorrow evening at one of our local synagogues to affirm the Jewish um, call to action on welcoming the stranger, immigrants and refugees. We have some um, political speaking, we have some rabbis speaking, and we've, we're expecting we, we, a large turnout. We hope to have an overflow crowd um, to really show this community that the Jewish community are, are allies with immigrants and refugees, and we were refugees once, and um, it is our place to stand with other immigrants and refugees. So I, I want to just also note um, that, that both HIAS and the Multi-Faith Alliance have been strong grantee partners of ours. We really appreciate their active involvement on the ground. 
um, as well as other organizations. Um, one particular organization that we've been working closely with is a member of MFA, the International Refugee Assistance Project, actually headed by a young Jewish woman, Becca Heller, who catalyzed a group of law students and legal firms from around the country. They've been besieged since the executive order, um, actively working on the ground on the legal actions against um, or fighting the order, and um, actually were very responsible for the stay that the federal judge um, in New York placed on the executive, on parts of the executive order on Saturday night. So I know there'll be some discussion about what funders can do to help, and I'm certainly happy to um, answer any questions or share more about the organizations um, that we've been partnering with. Thank you so much, Charlene. And now we're going to hear from Jenny Rosen uh, from Thanks. Hyatt. Thank Thanks. you so much. I was actually um, in Lesbos, Greece, meeting with highest clients, uh, refugees from Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan, when I got, uh, Charlene, your invitation about this webinar. Um, and so from the midst of really seeing firsthand the suffering and the loss of life that um, this executive order will cause, was just so gratified that JFN is doing this webinar um, at this moment. So really thank you, and, and thank you to our good partners at MFA. Um, I want to just take a step back to September of 2015, which is really when America and in turn the Jewish community woke up to the Syrian refugee crisis that had been going on for many years. Um, what shifted really was as the population moved to Europe, the media began to cover it differently. The iconic picture of Ayan Kurdi, um, the, the um, boy who washed up on the Turkish shore, I think really riveted and galvanized people and woke people up in a, in a different way. And there was an outpouring of desire to help from the Jewish community. Um, it's also worth noting, as Sana did, that, that then in November of that same year, um, many of, there was the backlash that came after the Paris attack. And, and I would say that some of the people who had been sort of eager to help took a step back, um, but certainly not, not the majority. And the, the overwhelming response from the Jewish community has really been one of, of wanting to help. And over the last um, 18 months, Hyas has really been mobilizing rabbis and congregations and individuals in support of refugees. Um, and I won't spend time um, right now in the short time we have talking about sort of where that urge and, and drive comes from, but I think um, it's both values and history, probably the most succinct, succinct way to say it. Um, and I think that some who had concerns about security, about anti-Semitism, I think after getting a better understanding um, of the extremely rigorous vetting process that's been in place for many years. Um, I think many of those fears were, were allayed. Um, and in general, people have been hungry for education. Um, and we and other organizations like MFA have been speaking and teaching around the country, and there's more demand than we can keep up with. Um, but people are also hungry for action. Um, and there are uh, a mobilization of synagogues. We have uh, now more than 260 synagogues that have joined the highest welcome campaign, which means that they, they signed on to a statement saying, we believe that refugees should be welcomed uh, to America. Um, and it also was a commitment to do one thing in the coming year. Um, and for some that's education, for some that's advocacy, for some that's direct service. Um, and we actually have many congregations across the country who've been co-sponsoring refugee families. So synagogues, uh, sometimes together with churches, uh, certainly sometimes other synagogues, sometimes mosques, have been welcoming the family and doing the really talkless work uh, together with the local agency that Mark was talking about, um, of helping um, to, to have families integrate into the local community and schools and doctors and furnishing apartments and all of that work. Um, I'll just give it an, as an example. Actually, Westchester is a place that we've been doing a lot of, of speaking and educating, and we kept hearing from the Westchester community, we want to resettle refugees here. And we kept explaining, that's not where the State Department, it's really up to the State Department, and it's an expensive area. And anyhow, to make a very long story short, they were not taking no for an answer. Um, and we worked uh, with a whole coalition of synagogues and community groups over a period of months to make the case to the State Department. And ironically, they actually approved um, in the very end of November um, that Westchester would be receiving, because of all of the, the groundwork that this group of synagogues did um, to set up the community to receive 50 Syrian refugees. Um, but example of, um, and we still hope there may in the future be a time when they will, will be able to receive them, but it's an example of a community really taking it on to say we want to be a place that welcomes refugees. Um, there have been coalitions of congregations um, mobilizing um, together to do in-district meetings with their congresspeople. Uh, back when the SAFE Act first came up, 
um, back in November of 2015, right after the, the Paris attack, there was an early, this was an earlier attempt to curtail refugee resettlement. And at that time, we had 1,000 rabbis um, sign on in support. Um, and it actually, at the time, made a real difference um, in what, what happened uh, in terms of, of, of legislation. Um, we have sort of reason to believe from, from various uh, notes that we got from inside, uh, from inside in, in D.C. That, pe that people were really moved to hear and, and our elected officials to move to hear that a thousand rabbis were taking this stand at that time, um, which was not necessarily the most popular stand. Um, we also, you know, there's been a lot of interest and engagement from national Jewish organizations over this last uh, 18 month periods with briefings for JCRCs and the rabbinical assembly came out with its first statement of, uh, ever uh, uh, on refugees. Um, we've been working with leaders across the country to draw, draft op-eds in their local papers. Um, and there's been tens of thousands of Jews um, volunteering and advocating and funding um, it, it was mentioned earlier that we work with Jewish family service agencies on the ground who are our partner in the resettlement work. Um, and we actually have, and, and I know the other refugee resettlement uh, organizations in this country also have really more volunteer requests than, than the capacity to, um, to employ, which is a, a, good, a good problem to have. Um, and I, I think that this fall, um, when the sort of terrible anti-refugee and anti-Muslim rhetoric rose up in the months leading up to the election, there were a lot of Jews who were already mobilized and ready. Um, there were a thousand Jews, or actually several thousand Jews, who sent letters of support to highest clients. So these were people who had newly arrived as refugees, welcoming them to America. Uh, we translated it into seven languages. If you can imagine what it would have been like to have, you know, fled persecution and violence, gone through a harrowing journey through many countries, gotten approved and selected for resettlement, gone through the whole vetting process, which can take 18 to 24 months of security and health vetting, finally arrive in America and to land here at the height of the, the rhetoric that was going on at that time and the rise of hate crimes. So part of the work, I think, also of the Jewish community, in addition to advocacy, is really uh, welcoming refugees who are here um, and letting them know that they are truly welcomed into our, into our nation, and into our communities. Um, and then two days before the inauguration, we launched a second rabbinic letter um, in support again of America welcoming refugees um, that was signed by more than, by more than 1,500 rabbis um, at that time. So when this horrific executive order came down, we really, there really is a mobilized base of Jews in gear to take action. And we've seen in the last few days, there are a lot of others in the Jewish community who had not been so involved, um, who now are eager to step up with this slamming shut of America's uh, doors and feel like this is a moment where I need to, to take action. Um, and we actually just in the last, since over the weekend, have now 2,000 rabbis signed on onto this letter. Um, and it's just one sort of reflection, I think, of the growing, the growing momentum. Um, as you probably know, there have been statements by dozens of Jewish organizations um, in the last few days, including all of the denominations. Um, some federations have come out, some have not. Um, uh, I think you know, that's an interesting uh, place to, to think about whether uh, we, uh, as communal leaders, have influence on the ways that our sort of official bodies take stands or don't take stands. Um, and Jews are taking to the streets um, in New York at JFK on Saturday night and then in Battery Park on, on Sunday. Um, there were Jewish rallies um, with Hyas and Ori Litzedek and Ben the Ark and different organizations uh, who gathered. Uh, we are gearing up for a National Day of Jewish Action on February 12th. We're just now um, launching. It'll be a rally here in New York, but we're developing a toolkit and resources for communities across the country to hold similar gatherings um, along the lines of what Charlene mentioned. Uh, but many communities don't have a foundation like the Leash Tag Foundation that's really going to, to mobilize uh, people in the same way and are looking for support um, to have those kinds of actions. I think that advocacy is so crucial in this moment. I think that's probably come clear through everyone who has spoken on this call. Um, and I think besides protests, there are other key actions. Um, messaging the White House. Um, we have 10,000 Jews who, who uh, in the last few days signed on uh, to a message to the White House calling Congress people. Um, we're organizing trainings for synagogues to hold in-district meetings their Congress people. Um, this is, you know, refugee issues, unlike immigration issues, have a lot of, there's a lot of power in the executive branch, but Congress also has a real role to play. And Sana, um, you know, began to lay out some of, some of, some of that. And so 
it's keeping pressure not just on the White House but also on, on Congress people. Um, and there, this is a moment really to advocate for grassroots um, work and of course the top policy advocacy level as well. Um, and we work with other refugee organizations and with MFA you know, as parts of coalitions in DC to do that and both kinds are really important. Um, as I mentioned, I think supporting refugees who are already here and are rebuilding their lives here and in the process of, of integrating to become new Americans um, and that, that it's really an inhospitable moment and, and the Jewish community has a role to play um, in welcoming and embracing those communities. And then the, the, the third part is aside from just fighting this horrific executive order um, and welcoming people, I think we have to build for the long haul. I, I wish that were not the case, but I think we need to educate and mobilize and continue to really build the base of support in the Jewish community, um, not just for this you know, specific order, but for the years to come and for, for, for refugees to the years to come. Um, and, the, and figuring out how do we have the difficult conversations in the Jewish community with those who might not be in favor of welcoming refugees. Um, and I think that the Jewish community has an outsized role to play, and I think this is for two reasons. For one thing, it's been our history, as has been you know, much spoken and written about, but I think because we've known America at its best and at its worst, I think because of that we speak with additional power and authority, um, and I think that's an important thing for us to remember. And I think the second reason we have an outsized impact is sadly because I don't think it's necessarily expected that Jews will be advocating for Muslims. Um, and I think refugee and rights for Muslims is not what has traditionally been seen as a Jewish issue. And it really makes an impression on our elected officials when we say, yes, this is clearly a Jewish issue. This is something the Jewish community cares so deeply about um, that it is mobilizing and advocating loudly for it. Um, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just close by saying, you know, I really think this is a historic moment, obviously, in so many ways, mostly terrible, terrible ways. Um, but more brightly, I think that there's never been a moment in history when the Jews, you know, we're refugee people, and there's never been a moment when we ourselves have not been refugees, but rather really been in a position to, to change the future for today's refugees. And so we've woken up and we're mobilized, and the American Jewish community has a, an urgent and critical uh, work ahead to ensure that our nation really is once again a place where people who are fleeing persecution and violence and torture um, can find safety and a place where they can begin to rebuild their lives. Thank you so much, Jenny. We are going to move on quickly to Georgia Bennett. Uh, she's going to talk a bit about how funders can help. I don't think we're going to have time for Q&A, but I will email the questions that you have sent in to me to the speakers so that they can answer you directly. I apologize for that. We just have very time Sorry, today. Sorry, it's Charlene. Is it possible if people have questions just to, we could stay on for another 10 minutes or something? Uh, uh, you, you can. I have to hop off at one. Unfortunately, I have another uh, call that I have to lead. So, but you guys absolutely can, and I support that. Okay. Well, I'd be happy to. So. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, can, I can stay as well. So, uh, Marav, thank you very much, and thank you to all of you who have presented for the very important and very noble work that you're doing, and we are so proud that you are our partners. So, having listened to all of the, um, the current situation in terms of what's going on with the new administration in terms of what is going on in Europe. The question for all of us as philanthropists is where are the gaps that result from these circumstances that philanthropists can address? So we know that we now have a complete shutdown of Syrian refugee entry into the U.S in all likelihood a decrease in funding for refugee agencies, and in all likelihood a tremendous increase in Syrian refugees massing at borders and in Turkey and Europe because of the entry of Russia into the Syrian conflict. So what this means is that we can expect a much larger and very critical role for civil society groups and for private philanthropy. So this would fall into basically five categories, and I'm, trying, I'm going to try to move through them very quickly. The first is humanitarian aid. 
The second is, is integration and resettlement. The third is advocacy and messaging. The fourth is um, research. Um, Marav, I'm going to ask you to advance to the next slide because the arrows have disappeared. Thank you. So first, in terms of humanitarian aid, given that there's going to be basically a shutdown of refugees coming into the U.S., one of the things that we need to do is to provide more aid in place for Syrian refugees. There's a tremendous funding gap um, that the U.N. has. And so there are various ways that philanthropists can help. One is by supporting efforts to meet the specific needs of the most vulnerable groups. Um, there's, there are small businesses in the refugee camps and micro grants can help more of those get started and get more cash circulating. Cash card programs have been proven to be a very, very effective way uh, to take care of refugees, especially urban refugees who don't have access to at least the modicum of services that exist in the camps. Um, Rav, next slide. In terms of integration and resettlement, so if we're not going to get any more Syrian refugees come in, it is absolutely critical that we take care of the 18,000 refugees who are already here. Um, now, most of these are resettled 70% by faith-based organizations like HIAS, which is one of the non and uh, one of the nine resettlement agencies that is certified to do resettlement in the U.S. It's also very important to focus on the five pillars of resettlement. The current philosophy in terms of resettling refugees is early self-sufficiency, meaning to have them employed within three months. And according to the International Rescue Committee, 80% of the, the refugees they resettle are employed within three months. But we argue that it's important to move, it's critical to move beyond early self-sufficiency to successful integration. So what are the five pillars of successful integration? Housing, jobs, education, language training, and trauma counseling. This is a highly traumatized population and there is an insufficiency of counseling for them. Now, it's also very important in terms of resettlement to support the sanctuary cities such as San Diego that are ready to defy the federal government and accept the cuts in their federal funding in order to continue to be places of welcome for refugees. So private funds are going to be very important in terms of replacing some of those federal funds. And ironically, um, Mayor Bill de Blasio of New York has pointed out that the funds that the administration is proposing to cut to those cities who defy them and continue to accept refugees the cut in the funds is going to be to the Department of Homeland Security. So the very agency that is meant to protect us from terrorism, those are the funds that are going to be cut to sanctuary cities. One of the things that needs urgent private funding is because we all of a sudden have a very large number of Syrian refugees, well, large for the U.S. because we've really been disgracefully behind in terms of bringing them in up, and, up until now, when now we can't bring them in at all. But suddenly, there is a much greater demand for services than the agencies that are providing those services have available. So private funds are going to be needed to fill in those gaps as well. The third area, which is very, very important and needs a great deal of philanthropic support is advocacy and messaging. 
as several of the of the presenters before me have pointed out, um, public opinion is going to be enormously important in terms of putting pressure on the administration to reconsider its policies. And in order to mobilize public opinion, we have to meet people where they are and address the three great fears that interfere with the development of sensible and humane policies in response to Syrian war victims, namely fear of negative economic impact, terrorism, and Islamophobia. We have an enormous amount of data that refutes all of these three great fears and counters the misinformation and misconceptions that are driving our current policy. Finally, research. I know that this is not a very sexy area uh, in terms of philanthropy in relation to refugees, but we have data that demonstrates the kind of messaging that can actually move the needle of public opinion. And so we need research that, that sheds light on the contributions that Syrians, the 86,000 um, first generation Syrian immigrants that have been living in the U.S. for 10 to 20 years. There's a lot of very interesting data about them. We need to fund research into alternative programs to resettle refugees, programs such as private sponsorship. We need to survey what faith-based organizations are doing. You have heard from Jenny what Jewish faith-based organizations are doing, but so many faith-based organizations are doing things. But we have to find out what they're doing and then identify best practices so that we can then promulgate those best practices to see how they can be most effective. And finally, we don't have longitudinal research that tells us what is going on with the refugees who have been resettled in the U.S.? Because we know that success stories about refugees are among those things that can move the needle in terms of public opinion. Jenny, we have one more slide. I think this is the last slide. And for those of you who are business-minded, I'm only going to take one, one, one fraction of a minute just to tell you to look at this slide because this is a very exciting new area in which issues like refugee resettlement and integration can be addressed through social impact investing. Thank you very much.